Yeah, when I was um, started speaking up here, a little bit younger, can move a little bit easier. Now I got a bad knee. They tell me it's got to be replaced. I'm too young for that stuff. But anyway, it's good to be here. How's everyone doing? What up? What up? What up? So I got to give a shout out to my Essential Christianity class. What's up? You appear in my class? Yeah. I'm not giving you extra credit for being here. And um, so it's kind of crazy because I do, like, you know, Dr. Johns and Dr. Taylor, it's always great to have you around here as well. Um, really appreciate you and love you and all that you're doing here. Um, I got to tell you, I, whenever I, I'm speaking, I have your parents start to Facebook me, text me, call me. You better give my son or daughter a shout out. And so I don't know. You start that. You have to keep on going. So I got to start it with, um, um, where's um, Josiah Torval? You up in here? What up, JT? What up, JT Jr.? And then um, I got to go with Alexa Cawthon. You share, we share names. Mark Cawthon's there. The Biltons, Anna and Max, you freshmen. I usually don't give shout outs to freshmen, but hey, I like your dad. He's good like that. Tessa Nichols, that's my girl. Sierra Reyes, where you at? Like Sierra Reyes, you, did you know that you were betrothed to my son Trey when you were young? So let's meet afterwards and let's talk about, let's, let's talk about closing that deal. You know what I'm saying? So you, I'm just keeping it real. Am I lying, Angie? It's true. It's true. And so, and then I got to give a shout out to my new life people, where's Jackson and Noah and Donkey, you know who you are, the Redding girls from Macomb, Megan and Abby. And then, is that all? Angie, like Angie wrote some down over here too. All right. That's, oh yeah, Jared Allen. What's up? We love your parents, Ben and Cherie. So let's get it going. Next time, maybe I'll give you a shout out. If I know your parents, maybe, maybe not. Who knows? But anyway, it's, this is kind of a real deal. I love always having the opportunity to share here at Evangel with you. I'm just going to kind of speak from the heart a little bit. This month, Angie and I and my bride is with me. Babe, stand up so they can see how pretty you are, so that people know that I married way above my pay grade. So, yeah. So that's what happens when you pray, people. You can marry a hottie. So we've been married 25 years, five kids later, and we're still in love, except for between 6.30 and 7.15 in the morning. But so, um, I love you, but I don't know about that. <laughs> I'm so random in case you didn't know. So, But I really do want to share a little bit. We, we've, this month, we've had the opportunity to, to share on the college campuses probably about five or six different times at a few different universities. And as I was thinking about and, and received this invitation to, to speak here, I, I just was like, okay, do I go with, with what's in our heart, what we've been doing, or do I go with something new? And, and I just sought after the Lord for just weeks and really like a month or so. And finally, I, I jotted some things down about three weeks ago. And I just, I was like, Lord, do you want me to share it? Am I going to do, is that what you want me to go? And I didn't really hear anything. And so finally this past week, we were speaking at SBU and I was sharing with them. And I was like, why should those students hear the, the words that the Lord's given to us and, and not you all? And so I kind of blended a few different things. And I'm just going to tell you, this is going to be a prequel message. This coming Saturday, we're speaking at um, Life360 Multicultural Campus, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish it off there. And so, you know, I guess that's a plug. If you want to come in here, the rest of the message, do that, Life360 Multicultural Campus. Um, but um, I just want to kind of share a little bit about what's in our hearts right now. And it's really about understanding the times. You guys know we got an election coming up, right, in a few days, and, and there's a debate tonight. Anybody plan on watching it? I know I've already got the DVR set. I'm going to watch it. We got to know what's happening here. There's a lot going on in our society right now, in our culture, and I know the tendency because I talk to people all the time. We get literally dozens of messages every day, and a lot of them are just like this. I just, I'm sick of it all. I don't watch the news. I don't pay attention. I just wish it would all go away. Well, it's not going to. And we, we, cannot, we cannot just put our heads in the sand. We can't just walk around just hoping that it goes away and, and our bubble. It, it's not. Issues with race, tension, politics, abortion, global warming, all these things and these issues that you all are faced with, problems that, that our generation is going to leave to you to solve, to figure out, you got to know what's going on. And right now, you're at university where you're receiving a four- or five-year, maybe some of you guys are getting a six-year heart and mind transplant. I don't know how long you're going to go. No judgment. But we got to make sure that we're doing this thing God's way. 
I, I'm going I'm to point you to a text that I stole from Vadi Bakum. It's First Chronicles 12 and um, verse 23. I'm going to read it. And, and I love this. It's, it's really, it's, he's talking. I heard this message, I don't know, a few months back. And, and I took his scripture because I thought it was so appropriate. We're in the middle of a war. It's a culture war. It's a war for the soul um, of the church, for the souls of of, of America, and, and really, more importantly, for the souls of people. And what's going to happen is the culture that we create, and in your case, the culture that you allow is going to determine if people are going to, to be influenced for God or to go along with the culture. It's a war. And I hope that you're engaged. You all have the privilege and the honor of sitting here at a university that professes Christ. We are a Christian university, and you're getting these messages. I hope that you don't take it for granted. I did a lot of times when I sat where you were sitting. But here's what it says in um, 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 23. It says, These are the numbers of the men armed for battle who came to David at Hebron to turn Saul's kingdom over to him, as the Lord had said. I think I sent a scripture up here. Did I start with verse 23? Yeah. Hey, I'm getting good at this technology thing. <laughs> okay, I didn't do it. My wife did. All right, so but anyway, um, and I can't even read this. You know I don't have my, my readers, my classes over there going, how does he read that stuff? It says, um, verse 24, from Judah, carrying shield and spear, 6,800 armed for battle. From Simeon, warriors ready for battle, 7,100. From Levi, 4,600, including Jehoiads, leader of the family of Aaron with 3,700 men, and Zadok, a brave young warrior, with 22 officers from his family, from Benjamin, Saul's tribe, 3,000, most of whom had remained loyal to Saul's house until then, from Ephraim, brave warriors, famous in their own clans, 20,800, from half the tribe of Manasseh, designated by the name to come and make David king, 18,000, from Issachar, Men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. 200 chiefs with all their relatives under their command. Man, when I heard this passage, I was just like, whoa, how how are you going to preach something out of that? Like, what's the importance of that right there? And, you know, if you go back into the previous chapter, they talk about David's mighty men and how David was preparing for for war and for battle to, to, to solidify Israel and, and God, there's going to be a change in, in leadership from Saul to King David and David's getting his people that were on his side and men were coming to him. God was sending them to him and they're preparing for battle. And so now we have a list of all these people. You got brave warriors. You got valiant warriors. You got people that are, that are good with shields, that are good with bows, men that were ready to fight to give their life. And then if you miss it, if you, if you blink, you're going to miss verse 32 from Issachar. 200 chiefs, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. I think that we are at the point in our nation where we need some people that understand the times and that know what we should do. I don't profess to be one of those. It's, it's literally with humility that, that we're given these opportunities. I, I don't consider myself an expert. We just I would say an accident, but I don't believe in accidents. But by the Lord's providence, he gave my family a video. You've seen the video a few years ago that's now been seen by 50 million people on Facebook. And we are literally being pulled, drawn, and just, just I mean, people are coming to us. What do you have to say on this area? And so we realize the weight of that. I'm studying, I'm reading all the time. I'm watching hours of, of news and videos because I'm like, Lord, if you have something that you want me to say to the people, please give it to me. And I find myself coming back to this passage here. Lord, am I one of those people that, that's seeing something and that understand the times? And if, if I am, what's the message that you want me to deliver? And here's, here's something that I want to share with you all here um, at Evangel. It's the first time I've ever shared this. The Lord gave this to me just a couple weeks ago, and I, I just sat on it for a moment. I woke up early, and he just gave me this, like in the midst of this culture war, in the midst of this, this tension that we're experiencing, the, the, bat, the racial struggle. I mean, it's all around us. Here's some, here's some things that I, that, that I wrote down. We, we have to understand the times. 
And so I don't even know how many there are. Um, I just I made a list here. Looks like there's nine of them. Man, if I'd have known that, I would have added one more because I'm anal like that. I like 10. But anyway, in this case, we have nine things. I want to give you some observations of things that I see in the times. And, 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 and I'm going kind of, to kind of bring this home in, in a second. But here's the deal. We have to understand the times. And right now, we all realize that we're on high alert racially. I mean, it just is what it is. White people are scared to death. I know you guys are. You guys walk around like, oh, I ain't going to that one. I ain't saying nothing to that. Oh, I better stay away from that Facebook post, pretend like I didn't see it. White people are scared, aren't y'all? Tell the truth. It's true, isn't it? Y'all are scared to death because the worst thing that could happen to you is to be labeled a racist because of something that you said. I mean, it is true, right? And I mean, we've known that for a while. My wife and I, we wrote this book. I've been talking about it for a while. I literally have, we have we've had a donor We've had a couple donors, actually. Nixa First Assembly, thank you. Pastor Chris and Amy Foster, they donated about 100 of these books. I have some of my friends that were alumni donating another 100. We're, we're going to get, I think there's about 220, 240 books out there. When you leave, you can have one. If you're going to read it, you can have it. We want to resource you so that you can know what's going on. And um, this is a book that we wrote. God gave us this book. It's from that video. But again, at the end of it, if you want one, take one. They're out there in the lobby. But just read it. Take it. Give it away if you want to. But here's the thing. We are on high alert because of racial tension. Here's another thing that I've noticed. Politicians are using that tension um, to divide so that they can secure their power. It happens on both sides. I mean, it does. You, you just have to understand that. And I get, listen, you need to vote. I voted early already. I got it done. But we have to understand that politicians on both sides, Republican and Democrat, they are using this racial tension to stir us up to keep us on high alert because it's an opportunity for them to grab power. If they keep us divided into voting blocks, we're easier to control. If they keep us separated and fighting with people that we don't agree with and that don't have the same ideologies and beliefs, then they know we're going to be segmented. We're going to start fighting with people that are relatives of us. You don't know how many phone calls I get from church people. My son, he, he won't even talk to me now. He won't let me see my grandbabies because of politics. That is stupid. And we're getting divided, and we are falling for this mess. Christian people fighting with each other because of Trump or because of Biden. Either they're both racist or neither one of them are racist. And who can, is that the biggest thing that we can be as a racist? If you're racist, we shut you down. Don't talk anymore because you're racist. Which, if you're not talking with somebody because you think they're racist, then you're obviously not going to be sharing the gospel with them. So the gospel's not going to be spread because we think that people are racist? That's a trick from the devil. Let's stop falling for that mess. I'm not saying that everybody, there is racism, and we need to challenge that and call it out. But some things are just racially ignorant. Some things are just racially insensitive. We need to know the difference. That's why we wrote a book. It's free to you. Take it. Educate yourself. But politicians, man, they're using this tension to divide us. We're segmented into groups, and we proudly display our affiliation and our allegiance. We do it all over Facebook. You let me know what groups you belong to, I'll let you know what groups I belong to. And we're saying to other people, if you don't agree with what I believe, then you know what you can go and do. That's an observation. Here's another Observation when we're understanding the times, the 24-hour news cycle continues to exasperate the issues. Man, there's things that we need to discuss. I get it. And we need to be informed. But man, all that news over and over and over, now they're just getting into their opinions and what they think. And then they're prognosticating on stuff about this and that. And, and now they're, all they're doing is just giving us rhetoric, ideologies to try to indoctrinate us. Are you going to be on the side of Fox News and Morning Talk Radio? Or are you going to be on CNN, MSNBC, and Mainstream Media? Which side are you on? Pick a side right now. And if you don't pick one, we'll decide it for you. That's what they're trying to say to us. And us Christian people, we're just falling right into it, hook, line, and sinker. Why are they doing it? Because of money. Ratings. They're getting paid. Late night talk show hosts, they were dying until they started to go all in on politics. I mean, this is, it's because of money. The media is not helping the problem. Here's another observation. Add to that the popularity of social media means the need to post. I, I say the need. I, I need to 
to post something every two or three days. You know what I'm saying? Like, right? I mean, you know, you know. Oh, I gotta, I gotta post something. What am I gonna post? We have to do it. We don't have to talk with people anymore to understand what they believe. We just read their posts. And if we agree with them, we like it. If we don't, we label it. If we got time, we argue with them. Come on, I know what's up. (laughs) Am I the only one? Here's another thing, man. (laughs) another, Another thing that I noticed. We no longer offer the benefit of the doubt with people because we've already labeled them. We know who they are. We know what they stand for. We know they're liberal. We know they're one of them crazy conservatives. We know they're, they're you know, for, for abortion. We know that they're one of them Bible thumpers. We, we know, so we don't have to talk with them. We don't have to dialogue with them. We've labeled them case closed. The next thing is to cancel them because you know, if we don't cancel them, then they'll keep spreading their ideology and then other people will start believing it. Here's another observation. We're quick to jump to conclusions about people and things which causes us to ignore facts. We're ignoring them all over. Or we try to get facts on our side. You become one of them, them fact fighters. Well, you go and you pull up your article that supports your belief on coronavirus, and then somebody else pulls up their article, and, and then while we're wearing masks, we don't need to wear masks, and we're fighting over silly, stupid stuff. I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but why are we fighting over it? Why are we ignoring people? Why are we isolating people and ostracizing people? And why are we distracted from what we were called to do, which is to spread the gospel? Here's another observation. People prefer to emote instead of think. It's the way I feel. My feelings are valid. I'm speaking my truth. We got to start thinking. Because sometimes we have to look at and and realize, okay, wait a minute. Well, this side's telling me that, and this side's telling me the complete opposite. Wait a minute. Something's not right here. It doesn't pass the smell test. (laughs) You know what the smell test is. If you you got junior high boys, you know what the smell test is. You know what I'm saying? Like, (laughs) but we got to start thinking. We can't just, like, emote and just, you know, we, we, we watch the news. Oh, that just makes me, I can't believe this is happening. You see a red MAGA hat. Oh, it just infuriates me. Da, 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 da. We're just emoting. I don't care how you feel. I'm going to say it again. I don't care how you feel. Man up. Put on your big girl underwear, whatever it is. Can, I, can I say that, Angie? No, I can't even say that. All right, well, I didn't say panties. I said underwear. I mean, what's it? Okay, it's too late. Okay, well, my bad. But we got to grow up a little bit. And and I'm talking to, you know, I've shared with you before, this message is to Christians. Our message in our ministry in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through 7, so that we know that God is light. In him, there's no darkness at all. If we claim to be in the light, but we don't live that way, then we're liars. Because the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. Even the sin of racism. I'm talking to Christians here. We're the ones who have to to think. We're the ones that have the word of God that we get to read this. And and we're disciplined enough where we should be, where we're reading it on a daily basis. And we're going, Lord, speak to my heart. Speak to my mind. Let me know how to think and what I should think. Not the news. Not not Don Lemon and not, you know, Sean Hannity. I mean, this, this. Too many people want to emote and not think. And here's the problem. Because we're not thinking, this is another observation. We've misunderstood what's really going on. And now we're going with the crowd, with the mob, whatever you want to call it, because we haven't been thinking. And this brings me to my final point, my final observation. And I've wrestled with this for a while. I've wrestled with it. The Lord put it into my spirit a while ago, and I just wrestled with it. I've talked to a couple of my mentors, and I said, hey, here's a thought that I have. Is this right on? And I've had them give me some pushback on it. But here's here's the deal. This is my, my observation of the time. Because of where we're at, because of all the things that are coming at us, and especially for your generation. And I know that you all are people who want to get involved. You you just feel injustice, you see it, and you know it's not right. And, and you all, your generation, 
all of you guys, your generation by and large is saying enough is enough. We, we want equality. We want justice. And I want it too. And I thank you for what you're doing. But you got to understand something. In our fight for justice, we have to understand there's a difference between racial reconciliation and social justice. Let me say it again. There is a difference between racial reconciliation and social justice. And, and, and I'm going to go into this even more this Saturday when I speak at, um, at Life360. And, and I, I did a study on it in the Bible. I'm looking up reconciliation. And, and here's, here's the heart of reconciliation. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21. I'll just kind of paraphrase it. It says, through Christ, God reconciled us to himself. And then he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So the heart of reconciliation is this, that first and foremost, you, me, and everyone, the eight, nine billion people on this earth, should be reconciled unto Christ so that they don't have to spend eternity in hell. Even the racists, we don't want to spend eternity in hell. So the the heart of reconciliation is first and foremost to reconcile people unto Christ. Through Jesus, God planned to reconcile the world to himself. That is salvation. And then it goes on to say in verse 20, 21, now... We are Christ's ambassadors. Now we're called to the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation in every capacity. With your family. Between the sexes. Between the races. Racial reconciliation is a part of reconciliation. And we are called. Those of us who have been deemed. Those of us are Christians. Raise your hand if that's you, Christian people. We are called to reconcile people, all people, to God to themselves. That's discipleship, helping them grow, helping them work through some of their junk and to each other. That's racial reconciliation. But here's the deal, social justice. And I looked up the definition. Here's the definition of social justice. It's justice in terms of the distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within a society. It's the fair and just relations between the individual and a society. It's the view that everyone deserves equal economic, political, and social rights and opportunities. I agree with that. I mean, right? We believe that, right? I do. I want everyone to have equal justice, equal opportunity, economically, socially, politically. I do believe that we need justice. But here's the problem, and and this is my, my, my understanding the sign of the times to you as young Christian people that are training to go out and do ministry, whether you're in the full-time pulpit ministry, whether you're in the ministry of being a lawyer, whether you're in the ministry of being a teacher, all of us are called into the ministry. All of us are called to do God's work, which is to spread the gospel, all of us. And here's my, here's my, my warning to you. Here's my, my charge to you, my plea to you. Let's not get distracted. Our job, and we're called to racial reconciliation, to all reconciliation. We're we're called to the ministry of reconciliation, not to become social justice warriors. I realize this, that reconciliation includes social justice, but social justice doesn't always include reconciliation. Sometimes it leads to white privilege, white guilt, white fragility, reparations. And that's why your parents... A lot of your white evangelical parents, they have a hard time with this message of racial reconciliation because the church has missed it and we've messed it up and we've, we've jumped on board with the social warriors. With the so- and did you know that there's social, war- social justice is not even in the Bible? I mean, it's not. Now, justice is. God is a God of justice, and that includes justice in all manners. But one of the reasons why we're having issues and problems and why some people in the church are very silent because the mob now is telling them either you're down with our, our social justice message or you're a racist. And then, therefore, white people go back to being scared again. What we should do, what the church needs to do, is we need to understand that we're called to the reconciliation business. We want to help reconcile people into God, ourselves, each other. We do it through studying what the Bible has to say about equality, about justice, about fairness, economically, socially, racially. The Bible has to be our guide. The church, and I say the church because you all are future leaders in the church. 
we cannot abdicate leadership to the world. Because then we get binary choices that, that we just can't get down with. Do black lives matter or do all lives matter? That's a terrible, terrible choice because it's meant to divide. I do believe that black people matter. I do believe that black lives matter. I do believe that all lives matter. I believe that blue lives matter. People ask me all the time, and I actually did a video on this about the difference between black lives matter, the sentiment, versus black lives matter, the movement. We need to understand some of these things. I can't get down with the movement as a black person. One of their biggest things is that they say that they are for the dismantling of the nuclear family, American family. I read Patrice Kalur's book because I wanted to get a better understanding of it. I'm like, whoa, now, wait a minute. I was in St. Louis when this movement w took steam. It started, you know, when Trayvon Martin was killed, and then I went in St. Louis at Ferguson, and I was on the streets. I'm helping march. I'm helping keep peace between the police and the people, seeing, you know, stuff thrown over my head. You know, whoa, what's going on? And I mean, I know what I'm talking about on this one, and I saw the movement come on, I saw with the, and it started with the sentiment that, yes, Black Lives Matter, and what they're saying is we matter too. I saying that white people don't matter, but we matter too. It's like when Martin Luther King was saying, I am a man. When Oprah's saying, I speak your name. I see you. You're important. You have value. But what's so sad is because the church was so silent for so long in the matter of reconciliation, specifically racially, you have this secular movement that has come up onto the scene and they've gained steam. And it's easy for us in the church to say, yeah, I either like it or I don't like it. And then now they've led us to a place where we don't like that they led us to. Because the last thing that we hear about Black Lives Matter, they're chanting through the streets of Charlotte saying, F, you're Jesus. And they didn't say the word F. I can't be down with that. I think we need more black men in the family being husbands, being fathers. That's my biggest mission other than being a Christian is being a husband and a father. I can't get down with dismantling the nuclear family. And it offends me when you want to say F, my Jesus. So what happens is there's some things that need to be discussed. There's, there's stuff that we need to talk about. You guys are going to be the ones leading those discussions. Future leaders, future Christian pastors, future lawyers, future doctors, man, future community workers. I mean, you all are going to be the ones that lead these discussions. Please understand the difference between reconciliation and social justice. And this is why we have so much fighting today because we don't understand it. Because too many churches have gotten into the social justice business and they forgot we're really in the reconciliation business. And then other churches um, are on the sideline doing nothing because they don't know what to do or because they're afraid of doing it. It's not what God's called us to do. The world is trying to lead the reconciliation efforts, but they don't have the proper end in mind. That's why we need to lead because we are men and women who have the spirit of the Lord on us and we know what we ought to do. Study to show yourself approved. I want to say a prayer for you. I just want to encourage you, don't be afraid. You don't have to walk in, in fear. Uh, there's so much we can say on this, if, on this topic. I hope that you go and grab one of those books. Educate yourself. Know what's going on. But we're going to get through this. We're going to do it. You guys are going to be the ones that lead. Amen? Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you so much for these young people, for their hearts and their spirits and their minds, Lord, their willingness to come and and to be a part of this, Lord, I thank you that they're fearless. They're not afraid of, of, of con conversing and talking and interacting with people that don't look like them, Lord. God, right now the devil's trying to twist it. He's trying to turn things. He's trying to stir up junk from, from decades and, and centuries ago. But we say no. God, we're Christians. We have the light of Jesus in us. And we want to live that way. And so, Lord, I pray for each and every student, every faculty, every person watching this, Lord, that we get and understand this message. We want to be in the reconciliation business, Lord. Reconciling people unto you, reconciling people unto ourselves and each other, Lord. I just pray for each and every student here. Give them your message. Be with them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love, peace, and hair grease. Thanks for your time.